All right. Open your Bibles, please, to Ecclesiastes chapter 7 for the last sermon of this chapter today. Dear Father, we do pray for a blessing upon this message. I do pray that you will deliver many from deception. We do ask God that you give me good ground to preach upon. Fill me with thy spirit. Thank you so much for the preserved scriptures, the lamp to our path. In Jesus' holy name, amen. My text is in chapter 7, verse 27 and 29. Behold, this have I found, saith the preacher, counting one by one to find out the account. Lo, this only have I found, that God hath made man upright, but they have sought out many inventions. There are many dangerous cults out there. But God forbid, if you ever lose your children, there is a probability that you will lose them to this cult that I'm exposing today. The title of my message is The Cult of Science Exposed. Exalting the Bible. And that's what I intend to do today. I intend to exalt the Holy Word of God. The Scriptures. Our only infallible, absolute standard for judgment. The reason this cult is so dangerous is it pretends not to be a cult. It pretends not to be a religion at all. In fact, it even says that we don't care about belief. We don't care about faith. That is for religions. We, we don't operate in the realm of belief or faith. A lot of times people might be good at math, but ignorant when it comes to the English language. In Christianity, we do not exercise blind faith. We have evidence for what we believe. That's very important for you to understand. And this is a great perversion of the English language, which I don't have time to get into. Let me start off by saying, in verse 27, there is a place for counting one by one. There is a place for researching the natural world. Solomon was gifted in this area of natural research. It says in 1 Kings 4, And he spake of trees, and he spake also of beasts, and of fowl, and of creeping things, and of fishes. And there came of all people to hear the wisdom of Solomon from all kings of the earth. But we see in verse 29 that Solomon tells us that mankind has wickedly and rebelliously sought out many inventions since the fall of Adam and Eve. This, rever this refers to inventing material things, mechanical things, as well as new ways, new concepts, new ideas. The word invent means to come to, to find. Webster says it's the action or operation of finding out something new as the invention of the art of printing. This invention of printing is a good example that illustrates some foundational things that I want to share with you today. First, it shows how an invention can be used for good and bad. The Bible was printed on the printing press. It allowed people to read the Bible in a way that was never possible before. But it also allowed a lot of occult books to be printed. And it brought a revival of occultism like the world had never seen. Think of the web before it was largely controlled like it was today. It allowed an opening of information and truth to prosper around the world but it also allowed wicked things like pornography etc if y'all get too cold just turn those things off um, 
The printing press also shows how inventions may be, at least in the first stage, too quickly associated with sorcery. Samuel Palmer, who died in 1732, gives us the general history of printing. He said, Foss sold, so, I like that name, Foss. Foss sold some of them at Paris, talking about his books. But the buyers finding a great number upon him, then it was possible for several men to tra transcribe in their whole life, and the pages of each copy so exactly alike that he was seized, tried, and condemned for magic and sorcery, and was accordingly dragged to the stake to be burnt. But upon discovering his art, the Parliament of Paris made an act to discharge him from all prosecution and consideration of his admirable invention. In fact, many believe that the whole legend of Faust uh, as a sorcerer was derived from this invention of John Faust, which was not understood at the beginning. Erasmus tells us, what praise is due to printers, we must gratefully remember the first inventor of this divine secret, John Faust, as also Fox's Book of Martyrs explains. These early historians show that Gutenberg, Gutenberg was only a rich neighbor who began to notice this printing press, so to speak, in the garage and wanted to fund it. So court documents show, uh, we have the court documents. They show that Gutenberg was only a funder, a, a financer of the printing press, and the inventor was false. But this is going to be something very important I want to explain. One historian switched the names, and it became entombed in history and got it backwards. What I want you to realize is one mistake one mistake can for centuries be passed down, generation after generation. In regard to witty inventions, our Bible says in Proverbs 8, I wisdom dwell with prudence and find out knowledge of witty inventions. It's not wrong to research. It's not wrong to invent things. Second Chronicles 26 says, He made in Jerusalem engines, invented by cunning men to shoot arrows and great stones with them. So it's not my intention to judge scientific researchers too harshly. That is not my intention. As one scientist pointed out in a book, he stated most of us are just trying to pay bills. We're, we're not smart in all these other areas. But the problem of just trying to pay bills can lead to great evils, you understand. The love of money is the root of all evil. It can lead to a lot of compromise. It can lead to a lot of error. So while we should not judge too rashly everything that we don't understand, we must nevertheless realize that many inventions are diabolically wicked or they are used for great wickedness. And many times it would have been better had they not been invented. The Bible says in Amos 6, talking about wicked people, they will chant to the sound of the vial and invent to themselves instruments of music like David. This is certainly a mechanical invention. Psalms 99 says, Thou was a God that forgavest them, but thou tookest vengeance of their invention." Psalms 106 says, They provoked him to anger with their inventions. And the plague break in upon them. Thus were they defiled with their own works and went a-whoring with their own inventions. Romans 1 says, Backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, they're all worthy of death, says God. In fact, it isn't edifying to even speak of the wicked inventions that the ancient pagans came up with. And it's certainly not edifying to even speak of what's happening today with this technological explosion and the ability for man to do such wicked things is beyond belief. And listen to me. Just because something is made easier doesn't mean that it's good that you invented it. The question is at what cost? 
What cost? What did industrial farming bring to us? The destruction of the village life. The destruction of the agricultural life. What about pesticides? What did that bring to mankind? The destruction of all of his water, just about. Cancer. What did antibiotics bring? You say, oh, what wonderful inventions. Yeah, why don't you Google the antibiotic apocalypse and see what's happening now with bugs and diseases and things they can't even cure anymore because of this manipulation of nature. They curse the world. Let that young Greta teenager speak about what's really cursing the future of her generation instead of being used by the UN and all of this one-worldism. No, there's a lot that's cursing this world. There's a lot of evil and love of money that is cursing our world. And it's not just the inventions themselves, but the mere attempt to try to do certain things is blasphemous and rebellion against God. Notice it says in Ecclesiastes 7, they sought out many inventions, whether or not they were able to bring them to pass or not. Thomas Edison, a card-carrying Luciferian theosophist, follower of Madame Blavatsky with her magazine, Lucifer. We know what he brought to the world, which could be used for good or bad. But before his death, he was trying to invent a mechanical way to contact spirits, a better way to contact devils than the Ouija board and such like. Certainly today we have the genetic manipulation of creation, trying to mix animals, different goats and humans together and all of this stuff. You think God's going to just sit back and allow this to go much further without judgment? It reminds us of the great technological advances in the days of Noah. Read about it in the days of Genesis. The great, revival, uh, uh, the, the great revolutions in technology. But what did it culminate in? It culminated in the wickedness of the whole world that only one family could be saved. And finally, God destroyed the whole world. And we know there was interaction with devils. I'm sure that is going on today like never before. That much of what is occurring is at the inspiration of devils. Man wants to be unrestrained. He wants to do whatever he imagines. Unrestrained ability is hurtful to whatever degree man could ever bring it to pass. Look at Genesis 11, and they said, this is what mankind did. They gathered together in a one-world government, and they said, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. See, the devil was able to manipulate mankind. From the beginning, he fell. What was his cry? In Isaiah 14, his five I wills. I will ascend up to heaven. He wanted to be like God. He was not content with earth. And so we see mankind wants to go off of the earth and, and wants to go up to heaven. That is rebellion. Go visit the Epcot Center there in Florida and you'll see all nations coming together and they state what their desire is. Their desire is to populate what they call outer space. To ascend into the heavens. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they all have one language. And this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Is that a good thing? No. You know why? Because God says they won't seek after me anymore. This will be a hindrance to them seeking after me. So he scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth. And Acts 17 tells us that he put habitations, he put divisions among mankind that they should seek the Lord. The goal is the seeking of the Lord and a one world government does not help man seek the Lord. It allows man to be controlled by Satan. 1 Corinthians 1 says the Jews require a sign. They want a sign. Like the charismatics today. The Greeks seek after wisdom meaning the pagans in general, led by the Greeks. They want wisdom, wisdom, wisdom. 
But in their seeking of wisdom, they were not seeking after God. The Greeks believed that Christ crucified was foolishness. Natural science supposedly looks at what is observable. But this should never be done in rebellion to God. To deny the supernatural and the non-material is foolish. And there came a time when science began to wear a mask that said, we don't believe in the supernatural, we don't believe in magic, we're just materialists. The very idea, though, of whether an experiment proves a hypothesis true or false is beyond the realm of the material. You have a hypothesis. You conduct an experiment to prove your hypothesis true or false. What is truth? What is falsehood? What is proof? These are non-material concepts. The whole foundation of science is philosophical, based upon the non-material. That's why many physicists, when they finally considered this, they woke up and some became New Agers and Eastern mystics, others became Christians. The idea that everything's just material, like Bill Gates, you know, he says, I try to tell my daughter I love her, but really that's no more important than just indigestion in my stomach. It's just a chemical reaction. What a sad world to live in to actually embrace such stupidity. I'm a follower of science. I don't believe in philosophy. Well, you're an idiot. You're an idiot. Can you turn me up a little? Listen to me, folks. Being a great counter of beads or beans doesn't automatically mean that you're a great thinker. It doesn't mean that you're able to reason well. It doesn't mean that you're a student of the scriptures, the most important revelation of all. I want you to be good in math. I want you to understand this natural world. I pray that we grow in these things. But without growing in the scriptures, it's all in vain. Without learning how to think, and how to reason. Now hold your thoughts for a moment about this. Physicians, scientists, researchers, who are members of the science club or cult, will be bullied. They will be banned. They will be barred and possibly murdered if they depart too far from published dogma. If I had time, I would give you many examples. And anybody who has never been a member of that cult is immediately dismissed. And if you happen to be a fundamental Bible believer who takes the Bible literally, there is no end to the mocking. The first cult that I ever dealt with when finding the Lord, or the Lord finding me, was the cult of science. I was converted to the Lord with a friend that was going to UTA. It was there that I met opposition from feminism, atheism, humanism, and this cult of science. My friend's parents were atheistic psychiatrists. And she was bombarded with anti-Christian books to stop our conversion. I read them all. Fanatically, I poured through them with pen and paper, as well as all the issues brought up by the teachers at, U at UTA. I was leaving my worldly band days and my rock guitar, uh, my, my rock singer in my band happened to be a geology, a geology professor at UTA. And he was an atheist, a committed atheist. And in that world, we would have debates over the Bible, debates about God, debates about geology. So my point is when I got saved, the whole thing was this cult of science that I had to deal with. And if you've ever dealt with anybody in a cult, it is very hard to get them out of their cult. What's worse is when they don't think it's a cult, they don't even think it's a religion. I then had a really good friend that I was witnessing to and trying to bring him to Christianity. He was a devout atheist. 
And he flooded me with Robert Jastro, Marilyn Voss Savant, who had the highest IQ. Evolution was a major subject. And I began to study all of these books, and we began to debate and discuss. And he was finally brought to Christ through the whole thing. But what I discovered was you could be the smartest person out there when it comes to IQ puzzles and be an absolute idiot when it comes to logic or common sense or reality. I would debate with cult members at least once or twice a week of the Watchtower, the Mormons. I collected their material. I collected their old magazines and, and to prove their false prophecies and to show that their prophets were not of God. And I began to realize that this cult, this science cult, was much like the Catholic Church. One of the biggest religious cults in the world. It was like the Watchtower organization. All the printing and publishing is controlled. You must be a member. They control who is allowed to publish anything. If, if that's not a cult, I don't know what is. You, can ha you, you can't have any outside information, any outside questioning of the dogma of the cult. The people in the cult are arrogantly blind, like the Greeks who called Paul a babbler. When, the, when they look down upon you and think that you're a moron, it's very hard to convert them from their cult. Remember when Nicodemus dared question the religious leaders. They said, are you ignorant like the common people? Are you one of them? Don't you know we studied this out? That the Messiah is supposed to come from Bethlehem? But this Jesus did not come from Bethlehem. You know, you make one fundamental error in your reasoning and the whole house of cards falls down. He was born in Bethlehem. I read abundantly from men like Butler in the battles in the 18th and 19th century between deism and Christianity, infidels like whom my friend loved Nietzsche and the philosophers like him, so we spent hours and hours of debates and talk reading through this garbage and doing everything we can to discern it. As an early pastor, I had some physicists working in the super collider in our church, and we also had a physicist that later ended up working for NASA. Everything he said had to do with Richard Feynman. So I had to read all these modern scientists and try to help him not end up totally gone and shipwrecked by the science cult. A lot of those articles are on the Wayback Machine, but I did many, many articles upon this philosophy of science and the science cult in those early days. I began to see how physicists, especially, but really all branches of science, were moving more and more toward the occult. I devoured books like this, The Tao of Physics. His whole point is that science is not based upon logic, and neither is Eastern mysticism. You have to pretty much deny your mind, and where everything is moving is toward Babel, confusion that doesn't make sense. Opposites, yin and yang. Around 1999, I read Newton's works, but I wasn't aware of his sorcery until recent years. Since then, I've discovered that almost the whole early renaissance of alleged scientists was steeped in hermet hermeticism and occultism. The whole system now is taking its mask off to be set up on its original base in Shinar. Notice the following article. This man is no friend of fundamental Christianity, but listen to what he says. He writes this in The Guardian. He's the senior editor of Nature magazine. He says, Science, the religion that must not be questioned. It's time for the priesthood to be taken to task. If this scientist and editor of Nature magazine understands it's a cult, where are the fundamental Bible believers? Where are the pastors around America that will save their kids from this cult? Yeah. 
It's time for the priesthood to be taken to task. And journalists aren't up to the job. All scientific results are in their nature provisional. They can be nothing else. Someone will come along either the next day or the next decade and find that conclusions based on earlier results were simplistic, rough-hewn, even wrong. Scientific experiments don't end with a holy grail so much as an estimate of probability. No matter how fancy smancy your statistical technique, the output is always a probability level, a p-value, the significance of which is left for you to judge based on nothing more concrete or substantive than a feeling, based on the imponderables of personal or shared experience. I think it goes back to the mid-20th century, especially just after the Second World War, when scientists gave us such miracles as radar, penicillin, and plastics, jet propulsion, and Teflon, and mass vaccination, and transistors. Boy, I'd say that most of that is garbage, and we would be better off without it. They were wizards, men like gods, who either had more than the regular human complement of lethal gray cells or access to occult arcana designed to ordinary, denied to ordinary moral, mortals. We didn't criticize them. We didn't engage with them. We bowed down before them. It wasn't long before we realized that science gave us pollution, radiation, Agent Orange, and birth defects. They weren't priests after all, but frauds, all the time covering up the fact that they couldn't even agree among themselves about the science that they were peddling. Those who are scientists or who are pretend to be scientists cling to the mantle of a kind of religious authority. Folks, I don't even think we've come close to understand how crucial, how important your King James Bible is. How important the written word is to your life and your family. Let me present some questions to prove my point to you. I hope young people who happen to hear this sermon, will listen carefully. Do you ever wish, or have you wished, that you could hear a voice from heaven? Would that help your faith? You say, if only God would talk to me. What about a vision or an appearance with your own eyes? Do you know that if you did have one, when Peter had one, he didn't know whether he was awake or asleep, whether he had saw a vision or was just dreaming? You think I'll just have so much light if I could just have a vision, if I could just hear a voice. What makes you think that that is any more clear than the written words you have on your lap right now? Listen to what Peter said. Peter walked with the Lord Jesus. Peter saw a vision of the Lord Jesus, uh, whatever it was. He saw the Lord Jesus coming in his second coming in his majesty. He saw Moses and Elijah right there beside him. And he heard a voice from heaven. Listen to what Peter says. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Look at that word, eyewitness. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. Peter says, I saw it and I heard it. But listen to what he says. Listen to what he says, church of God. We have also, also a more sure word of prophecy Whereunto you do well, that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. That means it's inspired. That means God wrote it, not man. According to Peter the Apostle, those Scriptures that you have, are more important than anything you could see with your eyes or any voice that you hear, even God's voice. You think about that a little while. The scriptures are more important than your experience, your feelings, your dreams, your visions. Even what you see and hear, they are more sure. Let me show you why. Just let me show you why Peter said this. Look at John 12. Father, glorify thy name. 
Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and I will glorify it again. The people therefore that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said an angel spake to him. They weren't sure. Some said, I heard an angel. Some said, I heard God. Others said, that was just thunder. I didn't hear anything. You sure you heard somebody say something? Praise God, we can open up the holy word of God and find out what God believes about things, amen? Praise God, you can open that up and you can repeat it over and over and over and say, look at it, read it, study it. How can it mean anything other than what it says? I'm not dependent upon your experience. I'm not dependent upon your dream. I'm not dependent upon, you say God told me to do something. God's never going to tell you to do something that contradicts what he said in this word. But how can you tell me this wasn't of God? I'm telling you, I got God's word right here, and here's what he said. I had a man come and say, God told me to go leave my wife and become a missionary. God didn't tell you that. God didn't tell you that. How do you know? I know because I got a more sure word of prophecy. Robert Watts exposed the modernism, the liberalism that was coming in the late 19th century that Spurgeon wrote about and so many others. In the New Apologetic in 1890, it says, it must be admitted that the Apostle Peter does not place the word spoken even when uttered by the voice of God himself above the word written. Praise God. The primitive modern and church advocate, primitive monitor and church advocate of 1888 says appearances can change. Thomas had the word of Jesus plus the scriptures on the resurrection, I might add, but he wanted more. We too want to walk by sight. We would often prefer the vision of the mount to the more sure word of prophecy. Thomas had scriptures, and the Lord told them on the road to Emmaus that they are fools. They should listen to what the Bible said. The Bible said there's going to be a resurrection. The Lord had said he's going to resurrect in three days. But Thomas needed proof. He needed proof beyond the written word. He needed proof beyond what Jesus had said. He wanted to touch it. He wanted to fill it, fill the wounds. Thomas missed much because of his lack of faith in the written word, in the words of Jesus. Do you know that the Lord Jesus and Paul both argued on the basis of the slightest grammar points? Do you know Paul argued on the basis of the word seed not having an S on it in Galatians 3? He said this word is so important that even the letter S on the end of a word makes a difference. The Lord Jesus argued the same way about his divinity. He said, look what David said in the Psalms. Look at the words he used. The rich man in hell asked Lazarus, I asked if Lazarus could return from the dead so his brothers could believe. But what did Abraham say? In effect, Abraham said they have the scriptures. What could be greater than that? If they don't believe the scriptures, they're not going to believe, though somebody rises from the dead. Somebody did rise from the dead whose name happened to be Lazarus, a different Lazarus. And you know what they said? Did they say, wow, I'm going to go believe in Jesus now? No, at first they didn't even believe it. They had to confirm that it was really a resurrection. But they still didn't believe in Jesus. They still didn't believe in Jesus. They said he must have done it by the power of Satan. Wow. You be careful saying you need more light. You don't know what you have in our Holy Bible. None of us have yet to comprehend. What if you could have an apostle? If only I had an apostle. Acts 17. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul, an apostle, and Silas by night unto Berea, who cometh thither, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Did they just believe the apostle? They judged the apostle by the written word of God. Wow. Peter said you can judge that voice you hear from heaven by the written Bible. You can judge what you see, any vision, any appearance by the Bible. 
What if you had a prophet and you tested that prophet to make sure his word come to pass and he's a real prophet? Even then, the scriptures are higher. Not just a prophet that gives you a false prophecy, but a prophet that really does happen to get it right, either by chance or by demonic inspiration. Look at Deuteronomy. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign or a wonder and the sign or wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods which thou hast not known and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams for the Lord your God proveth you. What I'm telling you is this. You were to test the prophet by the scriptures even if what he says comes to pass. You are to test the apostle by the scriptures. You are to test your vision, your dreams. What did the living, walking Lord Jesus, when on earth, who happened to be God, what did he appeal to when dealing with the devil? Did he appeal to his name? Did he appeal to his identity? He was challenged, if thou be the Son of God. You know what he did? He appealed to the written word, preserved, perfect, infallible. The Lord Jesus, God himself, says that Bible is what I'm going to use to rebuke you. The written word, it is written, said the Lord Jesus. Not as Broadway Baptist homosexual church of Fort Worth. When I rebuked the preacher, he told me, listen, we don't follow Jesus in the Bible. That's just a book. We follow Jesus in heaven. We're so much more glorious, you know. You're following what a book says. I read out of the book of Jude that they went after strange flesh, and he's got these homosexuals in church. And he said, you know what? That, that's, that, that's the written word. You need to learn to follow Jesus. And, oh, I see what you're doing. I see. You, you want to get rid of the written word and follow a subjective Jesus where we have no way to prove or verify what he believes. Their Jesus can believe anything they want him to believe, which is why people want to get away from that book. Andy Stanley, that at one time had 30,000 or more in Atlanta following him, a preacher. I won't spend time to give you quotes, but he says, no, the resurrection's the proof of Christianity, not the Bible. He says, the Bible, uh, you, you know, uh, you, you can't hang your Christianity on the thread, the Bible told me so. He says, we know the truth of Christianity outside the Bible. The Bible, you know, there's all kinds of errors. and you, you, you cannot trust the Bible for your Christianity. And he's got all these people, thousands, that, that are embracing this now. See, they've been so talked out of the Bible by this new version crowd. The Catholic Church invented the originals only scheme. I proved that in my book, The Word. And uh, they, they want you to believe in these originals that aren't here. So you can't prove anything about... And they say the Bibles you have, you know, they're not perfect. None of the copies are perfect. There, there's no perfect Bible on earth. No wonder people are want an infallible church. No wonder they want to go to this nonsense. They don't have a Bible. Now, we're not told that the command of God was written down in the Garden of Eden. But we're not told it wasn't. We're not told that Adam and Eve didn't have a Bible. But if they were created in perfection, which they were, the Bible says God made man upright. Did they have perfect memory? Certainly they had a higher potential and capacity for memory than we do Adam named all the animals was it in one day if so then we can understand that the revelation of God was so to speak written in their hearts they were in a pristine paradise free from pollution MSG pesticides BPA and fluoride they had the most efficient brains and memory capacity. Thus, the, if they didn't have a Bible, the written word, uh, 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 the, the word of God was like the written word nonetheless to them. Now, here's where the battle begins. Here's where the battle begins. First, we see something very important. You don't want to be hindered in your cognitive areas, in, in your brain. You don't want to be hindered physically. 
That's why it's so important to watch your diet. Because I'm telling you, your generation, many of you, in the next few years, you're going to lose your brain. But what we learn from the Garden of Eden is that brain power is not where the battle rages. The battle is going to be fought in your will. Here's the question. Are you going to trust someone or something else or your own self above the revelation of God? Will you love someone else or your own self above God? Will you be double-hearted about all this? It may sound holy and humble that you exalt the living Jesus above the written word. But how are you going to receive guidance from the living Jesus? He's in the third heaven. You say, well, I have his Holy Spirit in my heart. How are you going to discern what comes from the Spirit and what comes from your own flesh? The heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. You must have an objective standard in order to prove and try the spirits, to try your feelings, to try your impressions, to see if they are of God. And notice what the Bible says. Psalms 138, for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. That word is dreadfully important. So my general subject is don't let anything be placed above the written word. That is the battle from here on out, folks. It's the battle for your children. Don't you let anything come before this word of God. It is the absolute infallible guide that we have for these last days. You must know it. You must hide it in your heart. You must study it. Do not let anything, any experts, any, any cult come between you and that written word of God. We could talk today about so many branches. We could talk about the charismatic Subjective revelation, the false cults like Mormonism that follow feelings and burning bosoms and prophets. Remember Jim Jones was an atheist, a communist, and he stood before the congregation and threw the King James Bible across the floor. They used it for toilet paper in their cult. And they said, I don't want you following the Bible anymore. You're going to follow me. And people laugh and say, look at that fundamental Christian, Jim Jones. He wasn't a fundamental Christian. But is that not what the science cult is doing? In fact, at a far greater degree than Jim Jones ever dreamed. There's one way that even people who mock the JWs and the Mormons and the Jim Joneses and the Charismatics, they mock these things and they think they're reasonable. But they're snared just like Eve was. This is how it works. There are a few things more important, I believe, to Satan than to keep this idea perpetuated. That there is not one single absolute infallible source of guidance, but there are maybe two or many more that are equal guidance. And whether that guidance be a voice in your heart, a voice in the sky, a dream, a vision, a prophet, or some kind of divination or experience. If you ever get snared, it'll be because you put something on an equal authority with the Word of God. And you believe there were two sources of divine revelation that were equal. There can be other sources of revelation and knowledge. You can learn a lot from your experience. God can communicate through your feelings. He can communicate through a donkey. He certainly communicates through the witness of the stars and nature. But there is one infallible, absolute way to judge everything, and that is the written word of God. And we are rapidly racing toward supernatural revelations with science. When Antichrist and the false prophet will deceive by signs and wonders, we're living in the day of images of Mary crying, of the alleged face of Jesus being seen in a blanket or a pancake, according to whatever news article you read. The Bible says when there's earthquakes and betrayal among family members, there will be signs in the heavens like never before. Right now, UFO sightings are increasing. 
But now with many of the supposed authorities, they're putting out the headlines and taking them more seriously now. You've already had popular astronauts alleging UFO contact. I want you to see, and I preached about it for years, where this is all moving. It's moving towards supposed contact with people from outer space or, or beings from outer space, so-called aliens, and they're going to give you the ultimate revelation. And people are going to believe that over the Bible. And there's going to be people saying, no, my King James Bible said this isn't true. How archaic. How ignorant you're going to be, seen to be, by these people. Notice the Drudge Report. Former NASA astronaut and moonwalker claims alien contact cover-up. Here's another headline. Scientists warn increased alien contact attempts, attempts leads to doom, says the science. NBC, this is just from the other day, yesterday. NBC, we may be closing in on discovery of alien life. Strange lights off Outer Banks spark debate. Another headline, UFO evidence undergoing in-depth analysis. Another headline, NASA chief says the world may not be ready for Martian life. Friends, you are moving toward the greatest deception. It'll be demonic. Now here's more headlines. Drudge, Oxford professor claims aliens are already breeding with humans on Earth. Aliens in the backyard, UFO community believes, and science starts listening. Alien ship may be among us, Harvard astronomer insists. Aliens, scientists detect more mysterious radio signals, still have no new clue. Alien artifacts may be lurking in solar system, Harvard astronomers claim. NASA scientists, aliens may have visited the Earth. UFO science uh, sightings cannot be explained or denied. Mystery, snake-like UFO returns to California. Navy confirms UFO videos real never should have been released. Marine says cigar-shaped UFO sightings spreading worldwide. They're not military. Snake-like UFO returns as mystery objects seen moving like it's alive over New York. More UFO sightings over Cincinnati as mysterious lights filmed vanishing. Google Schmidt is eyeing biology for the next computer frontier, digitally manipulating humans. AI bias, how tech determines if you land a job, get a loan, or end up in jail. Can AI create better priests? Robot clergy more acceptable to Protestants. AI experts say we are summoning robot entities who will treat us like ants. I want you to see where everything is moving. I want you to see it will have the mantle. It will have the authority of science. This thing called science is seen by many already as equal revelation to the written word or something above the revelation of the written word. And notice exactly what Paul warned about in 1 Timothy 6 in your King James Bible. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so called, while some professing have erred concerning the faith. Grace be with thee. Amen. Clearly, even true believers may end up following doctrines of devils or fables by trusting too much in this thing called science. Shame on the NIV. Shame on the NASB. Shame on the New King James Bible uh, version because they, get, they say they're supposed to be updating the word, making it more easy to understand. Why did you get rid of the word science? I tell you why they got rid of the word science. Because they don't want their cult to be exposed. Because they are followers of this cult. They are members of this cult. And they know what they're doing in these new versions. Many of them do. NIV says the opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge. Why did you get rid of the word? Why did you get rid of the word? The opposing arguments of what is falsely called knowledge. You're, you're telling me you translate a Bible after evolution and all the other garbage that's come from scientists and you get rid of the word science? Just like they deleted the word effeminate out of the new versions. You know what these people are about, my friend. What is falsely called knowledge? New King James Version? Where's the word science? Why are you not warning people about science? Where are the preachers? Where are the books? Paul says in 2 Timothy 3, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. They're going to be ever learning. 
but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Why? Because they don't follow the Bible anymore. They don't believe the Bible is the Word of God. Now, as Jannes and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. What were Jannes and Jambres? They were scientists. They were magicians. What do you think they were training Daniel to be? A scientist. A counselor. What God's showing us is in the last days, these authorities are going to be witches. You would not believe the occultism that Freud, Jung, and the psychologists were involved in. You would not believe the occultism that some of the most famous scientists of the world have been involved in. But that's nothing compared to what's happening today. So do these resist the truth. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou. How are we going to help? How are we going to combat against this? How are you going to keep your children? What can we do? Continue thou in the things which thou has learned and has been assured of, knowing of whom thou has learned them, and that from a child thou has known the Holy Scriptures. I say to every liberal scholar out there that is drunk with the delusions of this world, Timothy had a copy. He likely had a translation. Timmy, Timothy did not have the original manuscripts. Paul called it holy scriptures. Whatever he had was inspired and infallible, and Timothy read it and had heard it. It was in the synagogues that he grew up with. His mother and grandmother taught it to him. And what God's saying is in these last days, you better get your King James Bible. You better get the Word of God. And you better test everything. And you better test every idea, every invention of man, and see where it comes from. Where did this idea come from? And you better trace it back and make sure it originates in your King James Bible. You better make sure it's not against your King James Bible. Now here's my question. For something so pervasive, for something so dangerous as this scientific cult, so-called, why are Christians so quiet about it? It's like public education that I quote often, Charles Potter in the New Humanism, and he says, Christians, they're just laughing. They're saying they're so in the dark. They think evolution's the only thing wrong. Uh, from their standpoint, with public education. We have their children in humanist church. With so, so Christians have been so naive about public education for a century. They're so naive about the danger of Hollywood. You don't realize what they're doing in this movie, in this show, what they're doing to your children? But Christians feast on these things that bring their own destruction. And it's the same with the science cult. Science, according to David F. Horobin, a physiologist, says science is the modern God. In a disturbingly large number of ways, the position of science in the mid-20th century parallels that of religion in the mid-19th. Bewildered 20th century common men have accrued faith in their God, which they do not care to have questioned too closely, but which could be destroyed if it were demonstrated that their graven image has feet of clay. They must guard this God with every bit of energy and money that they possibly can. They cannot have their idol shown to be feet of clay. A cult has leaders who cannot be questioned. A cult has a closed, controlled system for publishing. A cult has fundamental tenets that are unbiblical, all mixed with a fanatical arrogance and blindness of its devotees. It has a vast network of propagation. And if ever a great number of people lose blind faith in the power of the cult, the whole thing is in danger of crashing. In previous messages, we've looked at how there is nothing scientific about who gets published in scientific journals. 
And even then, scientific misconduct and falsification abounds. One study recently has shown that one-third of scientists admit to committing questionable research practices. This is one-third of scientists say, yeah, that's on the borderline of falsifying this thing. One-third of scientists today said, yes, I have falsified something before. It's certainly questionable. When asked, what about other scientists? They say, oh, man, 72%. 72% of science. As long as it's somebody else, they say, you know, I admit that, that I've done it some, they say, but um, they say at least 72% of scientists have performed questionable research practices. In a applause study, Danielle Finelli says that increasing evidence suggests that known frauds are just the tip of the iceberg and in many cases are never discovered because fraud is extremely hard to detect and there's a high price for whistleblowing among the cult. Don Stewart has wisely written that there are many Christians who feel that they must make the Bible correspond to the current scientific theories of the day. If evolution, for example, is considered a scientific fact, then the Bible will be made to teach evolution. Those who take this approach are called concordists. They go first to modern scientific theory to determine what is true, and then they interpret the Bible in that light. Constant reinterpretation of the scriptures to make it conform to modern science undermines the Bible's credibility. Scientist theologian John Klotz perceptively summarizes the problem. The new God is science, and therefore theology must adjust itself to the latest scientific findings. Too often the question in church circles is not, what do the scriptures say? But rather, how must we change our understanding of scripture because of the latest scientific finds? This is not to suggest that the approaches, findings, and researches of the various academic disciplines are to be ignored, but it is a ministerial role, not a magisterial one. If Christians make modern science more authoritative than scripture, the Bible is at the mercy of the latest finds of a changing science. And you know what? They'll change quickly. They'll change quickly. You know how many Christians jumped on the self-esteem bandwagon? Oh, they jumped on it and they bought it just hook, line, and sinker. And then two decades later, the world's laughing and says, we don't even believe in this junk anymore. You know, at least many of them. A lot of psychologists said, well, that's what your problem is. You're spoiling the kids. They did that in the 1940s. Spock came and says, let your little one throw a tantrum. All psychologists and experts are saying that it's good for their development. So a bunch of Christians jumped on the bandwagon. By the time you get to the 60s, the psychologists were saying, you know what? It's you that raised these brats. You're having all these riots and chaos because you raised a bunch of brats by not disciplining them. In other words, they're going, to turn, they're going to change one day and say, well, you were dumb to follow us. You were dumb to follow us. Theologian John Wickham views the idea of making modern science more authoritative than Scripture as a double revelation approach. He writes, this theory maintains that God has given to man two revelations of truth, each of which is fully authoritative in its own realm. The revelation of God in Scripture and the revelation of God in nature. The theologian is the God-appointed interpreter of Scripture, and the scientist is the God-appointed interpreter of nature. Whenever there is an apparent conflict between the conclusion of the scientist and the conclusions of the theologian, the theologian must rethink his interpretation of the Scripture at these points in such a way as to bring the Bible into harmony with the general consensus of scientific opinion. Everybody wants to be smart, you see. Oh, I'm smart. I'm educated. I'm not this country fundamentalist scientist. So like a little lap dog waiting for your little doggy treat, you chase around these experts and they lead you exactly. That's not what leaders ought to do. Leaders ought to be men of God and stand up and say thus saith the Lord and we ought to stand up and believe our Bible I don't care what science says if, if it contradicts the word of God I don't care about your feelings if it contradicts the word of God I don't care about your dreams or your visions if it contradicts the word of God I don't care about some Martian who comes down supposedly on a UFO if it contradicts the word of God Wickham rightly chides those who hold to this double revelation view of interpreting scripture Taking this approach reduces the authority of God's word and places it in the hands of finite scientists. These poor children don't have a chance. They've grown up in Sunday school class. If they even went to church, they, they, they spend hours and hours and hours on the Internet and following humanistic, atheist, New Age, witchcraft, Hollywood. And then, if they ever do come to Sunday school, 
Uh, there's like little Johnny, why don't you read? And there's a big line right here that says, this is not in the original manuscripts. And I don't have that verse, teacher. It goes from verse 14 to verse 16. Where's verse 15? No wonder kids grow up thinking, where is the Bible? Where, where is God's word? They don't have any certainty. And men like John, uh, John White, James White, Carson, and others say, well, we're never meant to have this certainty. Just trust the scholars, you know. God forbid, they're growing up without any certainty whatsoever. And then they're spending this world where science is God and, and whatever they say, pretty much, you're supposed to believe. And oh, how sad. I'm going to tell you, I've written many sermons about how to raise a homosexual. But if you want to raise an atheist, this is how you do it. Genesis chapter 3, the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. Well, that contradicts God's revelation. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat it. I'm introducing to you right now, in the book of Genesis, the first person to ever join the scientific cult. She performed her own analysis. She used her own observation. She performed her own scientific method. And she said, you're right. I'm not just going to trust you, serpent. I'm going to look at this thing. It is good for food. We can eat this thing. I don't know how she, with her brain, with so much more capacity than we have today, I don't know how she performed that analysis, but whatever she did, she was wrong. She was wrong. She was wrong. Adam was not deceived, but in wicked idolatry, he partook of it with her and brought death to the world and to destruction and mankind. So when somebody, when a young person says to you, well, I don't understand why there's so much destruction in the world, it's because somebody performed a scientific experiment that they thought was above the revelation of God. This thing you're following that made you become an atheist, that right now, let me show you how it began. That's how suffering got in the world today. That's how evil came into the world today. She walked by sight, appearance, and not by revelation. God says, don't touch it. It's poisonous. God, God, I'm sorry. God said, don't eat of it. It's poisonous. 2 Corinthians 10, Paul says, do you look on things after the outward appearance? Understand, this means outward appearance only. Outward appearance only. It means, are you making outward appearance your, your main criteria? How can you have faith in God? I'm not talking blind faith. We know children have a tendency to draw conclusions based on superficial surface observations. That's why they're children. Paul says, Be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of man and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. It's time to grow up and understand that appearances can be deceiving. Even nutty Socrates knew that. John 7, 24, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment, says the Lord. He means don't judge solely on appearance. John 8, you judge after the flesh, says the Lord. About our Lord Jesus, Isaiah 11 says, He shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears, but with righteous judgment, righteousness shall he judge. That's the Lord Jesus. You're telling our Lord, God himself, is not going to judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears? The Lord is a perfect man, judge righteous judgment to show us as our pattern and example. Just like Peter says, we have a more sure word of prophecy. The Lord Jesus says, it is written, it is written, it is written. 2 Corinthians 5, Paul says, we walk by faith, not by sight. And to the atheist and agnostics, an ungodly scientist out there, this does not mean blind. Paul does not say we don't have evidence for what we believe. He says in Hebrews 11, now faith is the substance of, substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. He didn't say of things that don't exist. We don't believe things that don't exist. We believe things that our eye cannot see. 
I believe there's going to be a judgment seat of Christ. I cannot see it with my eye. Why do you believe it? Because it's written in the Word of God. I believe the Lord Jesus is coming again. I can't see it with my eye yet, but it's written in the Bible. I cannot see God right now, but I believe He exists. Why? For many reasons. But the Bible says so. The Bible says so. Faith is believing something when the physical eye can't see it. You could say to the atheist, do you believe in radio waves? Well, yes, I believe in radio waves because we know by, by, by evidence and other things that they must exist. And you don't know God exists? Nobody ever showed you the prophecies of the Bible to show that it's a supernatural divine book? You can't look at creation and see that there's a creator? But you believe in radio waves? Nonsense, says the scientist. What's the material basis of nonsense, I might ask? What is this thing called nonsense? How do you know it exists? Is your scientific hypothesis true? What is the material basis of this thing called proof? Of truth. Everybody must have faith or you're an idiot. Everybody must believe things that their natural eye cannot see or you're a fool. And if you don't believe in self-evident truth, I would C.S. Lewis say, I pray your mouth is shut because you're an idiot. John 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Wow, you ought to just bow the knee to that right there. That's our Lord Jesus. Thy word is truth. That word has been exalted above his name. That word that is written and is in our Bible, thy word is truth. There it is, folks. He could have said many things. He could have said, look at nature. It shows God. That is truth. Oh, but he says, I want to give you the infallible, absolute, certain truth that, that, that reveals to us God and the way of salvation and so much more. Thy word is truth. It is the only absolute, infallible way to know truth. So as I close, never let any cult get you to put the cart before the horse, to put anything before or above the revelation of the written word. Judge the philosopher by the word, the written word. Judge the physician, your doctor, by the word, the written word. Judge the psychologist by the word. Judge the scientist by the word. The Bible says in Isaiah 8, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Judge your own experiences and observations by the written word. It's time to get your kids writing every day the King James Bible. They ought to be writing chapters of the King James Bible, not just reading it, writing it. You ought to be studying it with your kids every single day. And you ought to be showing them why this Bible is above everything. It is so glorious that God has exalted it above His very name. And God, I tell you what, He takes His name very seriously. Don't you mess with God's name. Don't you watch something that blasphemes God's name. But there's one thing that he's exalted above his name, and that's that word. Show your kids why this word is true. Show them the prophecies of the Bible and why we know. I got saved, and it is the truth. I knew I was a sinner. God convicted me and all of that. But, but intellectually, when I read those atheists, I didn't know the prophecies of the Bible. I didn't know there were 300 prophecies just showing the the first coming of Christ. I didn't know anything about this. But they began to say, well, see, Christians say that the Bible's true because of this prophecy. But I tell you what, they convinced me. I, I can really say I became intellectually convinced to become a Christian by reading the garbage of atheists because they showed me the prophecies. I didn't know they were there. They showed me the prophecies. And I'm like, what's your answer for this? Man, I bowed my knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That is a book. There's no book like that one. There's no book on the face of the earth like that one. Hallelujah. Praise to God. Dear Holy Father, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for this book. I thank you for the King James Bible. I thank you, Lord, a time is coming when many will die for the Word of God. They will die. They know it's the Word of God. They're certain that it's the Word of God, regardless of what these pastors and everybody else is saying today. We believe in the inspiration of the Word of God, not just some original lost manuscripts that were never gathered together in one Bible. 
We believe, Holy Father, that you have preserved the word. We believe, according to your promises in Psalms 12 and Matthew and elsewhere, that you will keep these words, that you will preserve them till heaven and earth pass. We thank you, Holy Father, that we have not only an inspired Bible, we have a preserved Bible. And we thank you, Lord, that you're able to do this. Now, I pray everyone, Father, will be increased in their faith. And I pray that these young people will be revived, Father, to resist the lies of this world and that they will study your holy scriptures and love your word and preach it and teach it to the enemies in the gate. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen.